Today's class, we're going to discuss the transition from Canaanite epic to biblical prose narrative. And the main thing that I want to show is that in biblical prose narrative, there is a background in epic. And it's not a background simply in foreign epic, that is, in early Canaanite epic, like the Ugaritic epics, but rather it's a background in an Israelite epic. Although the Israelite epic is not part of the Tanakh. Okay, now I remind you that the Hebrew Bible right, is a selection of literature of what was preserved, right, what was preserved, and was transmitted over many centuries. However, we know from references in the Tanakh that there were other books, other literature that we don't have here. Right. Uh, in the uh, Torah, in Sefer B'midbar, Numbers 21, we have a reference to Sefer Milchamot Hashem, the book of the wars of Adonai. Where is that book? We don't have it, but it's quoted there. There's an excerpt from it. So here, and it probably wasn't just you know, a single work, a single poem, but it was probably a collection of several poems that had to do with the, uh, the, the uh, various uh, wars that the Lord uh, um, uh, carried out on Israel's behalf, or maybe other uh, 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 wars. Not only that, it may include things that have nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that theme of the wars of Adonai. Why? Because there's another book that's quoted in Joshua chapter 10, right? And it's cited as the source of a prayer of Solomon if you follow the Septuagint. And it's cited as the source of Jonathan's lament over uh, 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 sorry, David's lament over Saul and Jonathan in 2 Samuel chapter 1. Right? It's written in the book of Yashar. It's written in the book of Yashar. Now, that means that there was a book called the book of Yashar in which there were different poems or psalms that were included. And the fact that there were different poems and songs included means that the, all of the songs that were included on any, in any particular book could have been a collection, what the uh, later Arabs call a diwan, right, or an anthology of various songs, poems. And when you actually look at the Arab examples from the first millennium of the Common Era, we find that there are many different topics. Plus, we find that sometimes the entire collection is called by the name of one of the poems. Now, it's very possible then that the Book of the Wars of the Lord is called a book named for one of the poems, which is the Wars of the Lord. But there could have been other poems in that book too. And I think and this is a theory that I first proposed at the Society of Biblical Literature in 2006. It goes back a few years. And the, the thesis is that I actually think I can include one more poem in Sefer HaYashar, the book of Yashar. And not only do I think that I can include one more poem, I think I can include the poem that gives its name to the whole collection. In order to do that, let's first look at 2 Samuel chapter 1, the lament of David over Saul and Jonathan. Starting with verse 17. Vayikonein David et akinazot al Shaul va'al Yonatan b'no. David 
made this lament over Saul and Jonathan, his son. Vayomer, and he said, or intended, or he thought, Lilamed b'nei Yehuda Kasha, or actually he commanded probably, to teach the people of Judah, of Yehuda, the territory of Judah, Keshe. And this has been a crux, you know, for a very long time. What is Keshe? Which means, of course, the bow. What's the bow? Okay? Well, it was suggested by others before me. Um, for example, Morris Seal, in his book, The Desert Bible, that in the same way, let me, in the same way that uh, in the Quran, many of the chapters, the surahs, are called by the name of a key word that appears in that chapter, and various other Arab poems, songs, are known by a key word in that song. It doesn't have to be the beginning of the, of the text. It could be a word you know, that's somehow prominent in the song. Similarly, it's been suggested that the name of the song is Keshet. The name of the lament is Keshet, and it comes from a key word in the, the uh, song, in this lament. For, uh, the the, the, the uh, lament right, is directed primarily right, at uh, Saul and Jonathan, who have died in battle. Okay? Now, where is Jonathan specifically mentioned? He's mentioned a specific, in, a, in a number of places. But one of the places where he's especially prominent is in verse 22, which says, Midam chalalim mechelev giborim. From the blood of the various uh, victims in the battle, from the, the, the fat, the fatty flesh of the warriors in the battle, Keshet Yehonatan lo nasoga hor. The bow of Jonathan never went backwards. Becherev Shaul lo tashuv rekam. And Saul's sword never came back empty. In other words, it always was filled with blood every time you stab somebody. It's a little gory. But the idea is that, Saul, that Jonathan's bow never retreated, right? Never turned back. It, it, it was never uh, afraid of the enemy. So, Keshet Yonatan. Keshet is, I agree with uh, those who suggest, right, the name of the song. Okay, now we have exactly the same structure in another place in the Tanakh, in the book of Deuteronomy, where, again, a song is taught to the people. Right? In other words, the, uh, the person who declaims the song insists that everybody learn the song. Okay? And this is right before the song of Moses in uh, Deuteronomy 32. Look in verse 19. The Atta, in, I'm sorry, chapter 31 of Deuteronomy, verse 19. The Atta, Kivu Lachem et Now, you must write down this song. The Lamadan et Bene Yisrael. And you've got to teach it to all of the Israelites. Sima Bethihem. You've got to place this song in their mouths. Lema'an tiyeli hashira azot le'ed b'vne Israel. So that this song can be a witness against the Israelites in the future. In other words, I'm going to tell you now that in the future, the Israelites are going to stray from their devotion to Adonai, their national god. And when they do that, Adonai promises to bring punishments upon them. This song is evidence that they were warned before, and so they shouldn't complain when the punishment comes. Okay, now, the song then has to be taught. It's very, it's very similar then to the pattern that we find with the lament of David over Jonathan's song. 
And then we come to this famous song, Ha'azinu, right? Ha'azinu Shashamayim Va'adabeira V'tishma Ha'aretz Em Refi. Right? Hear, O heavens, or give ear, O heavens, and I shall speak, or that I may speak, and uh, listen, O earth, that uh, to the words of my mouth. And then he first starts by praising God and saying how God had first taken care of the Israelites when they were in the wilderness after the exodus from Egypt. Found them in the wilderness. Actually, doesn't mention the exodus. But God found the Israelites in the wilderness and bonded with them there, took care of them, just like a bird takes care of its young in the nest. I'm claiming that Yashar is the name of the poem. In other words, we know the poem, if you're in a traditional Jewish circles, you know it as Shirat Ha'azinu, the song that begins with the word Ha'azinu, right? Give ear, O heavens. Um, in biblical scholarship, the song is often called the song of Moses. However, I claim that it's called Yashar. If you look in verse uh, 4, God is described like this. Hatsurts tamim po'olo, the rock, right? His work is perfect. The kichol drachav mishpat, all God's ways are just. El emunav ein avel, God is a faithful God, a reliable God, in whom there is no corruption. Sadiq v'yashar hu, righteous and yashar, straight, has integrity, honest. And of course, in this psalm, we also find a kind of link between God and uh, Israel by the fact that God is called Hayashar and Israel is called right, Yeshurun. Jeshurun. Right? God is Yashar or Jashar. Jashar right? And uh, the Israelites are Jeshurun or Yeshurun. There's an emphasis on this keyword. All right, so I think that's so, okay. My point, though, is not just to give you my theory that uh, that we can now reconstruct a little more of Sefer Yeshua, but rather to make the point that in ancient times there were books that were collections of songs that, for some reason, were written down maybe because they were particularly attractive to the scribal community or to the community at large. Maybe they were for learning purposes. Maybe they were for some other purpose, which we don't know. They were used at various occasions during the year. Many things were written then, but these were. And later Israelite authors could rely on them, and could use them when they were writing their texts. They could take a whole poem, or maybe they could just take part of a poem. The only poems? That's the thing. As far as we know, they're all poems, and that's or songs, and that's what we find in all the examples, at least from Sefer Yashar and Sefer Milchamot Hashem. In those two books, right, that are mentioned, uh, we find a variety. We may, well, we find this, at least in the case of Sefer Yashar, a variety of poems, but they're all poetic. They're all in parallelism. Right? They're all what we would call poems in, uh, in the ancient Semitic context. Uh, we even go so far as to say the ancient Near Eastern context. Okay? So, we have then uh, a, a source of ancient poems which are probably not all um, uh, found in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible. Not everything is there. Okay. So the question now is, was there an Israelite epic? Could there have been an Israelite epic? And what would be the influence of it in the Tanakh? And can we find any more of it? And this is one of my ongoing uh, research projects. I'm very interested in seeing what can be reconstructed. I'm going to give you a sample of that in what follows. Okay, but first I want to show what w the typical situation. In the typical situation, we all remember 
that in epic, right, you don't go forward till you go backwards or you kind of march in place, right? We have parallelism in which things are repeated before you go on. I'll give you a, a, an example of this. For example, <clears throat> there's a Hittite prose text uh, called the story of Apu from around 1400 BCE. Hittite story. And Hittite story is in prose. Right, for those who may have been told or read somewhere, right, that prose was an invention of the Hebrew authors. Right, this is not at all true. There are ancient Egyptian prose texts. The Hittite tales are all in prose. Right? There's the story of Idrimi, which we're, uh, we're from North Syria, from the 15th century BCE that we'll be studying later in the course. Right. Uh, prose was not an invention of the Israelites, although most stories that we have encountered so far, especially of a highly literary nature, are in epic form, like the, like the epic of Gilgamesh and the Sumerian texts that we looked at. Okay, now let's, I just want to read you a little excerpt from the story of Apu. Apu's wife bore a son. The nurse lifted the boy and placed him on Apu's knees. Apu began to amuse the boy and to clean him off. He put a fitting name upon him. I'm reading from Harry Hoffner's translation in the book Hittite Myths. Okay, so you see why it's prose. There's no repetition, there's no going back. Each phrase, each clause, takes you a step far, farther ahead in the plot. However, if this were epic, we know what it would sound like. And we have, I'll give you a very brief excerpt from the story of Kirta, my translation, from the Ugaritic narrative poetry book, edited by the late Simon Parker. A, a similar story about conception and birth. Talking about Kirta's second wife. She conceives and bears him a son. She conceives and bears to him two sons. What do you notice? That this all could have been said in one sentence. Right? She conceived and she bore him two sons. That's all the information that's given. But in epic, which is an oral form of art, artful communication, in epic, when you sing, you repeat. And so, instead of saying, she conceived and bore him two sons, we read, she conceives and bears him a son, stage one, and then we just add a little to, to stage two, she conceives and bears to him two sons. So in the end, she bore him two sons, but in the course of telling the story, you tell it in stages, first stage, one son, Next stage, two sons, with a lot of verbal repetition. So in what we, the, the typical case in biblical narrative is that we don't have a lot of repetition. However, I call your attention now to the first item on the handout. And you know, for those out in cyberspace, I'm sorry that you don't have the handout here. Nevertheless, I think you'll be able to follow. Okay. This is from the story of um, Ahab and Naboth's vineyard. Right? And this is the plot to kill Naboth, Naboth, as, the, as it said in English, in order to get his, uh, his uh, orchard, uh, in order to attach it to the holdings in Israel of King Ahab. And, King, and Queen Jezebel, the Phoenician, whom Ahab married, of course, is held responsible in biblical narrative. Okay, so first, look in verse 9. She wrote books, that is, texts. But Tichtos Pasfarim Lemur. She sent out texts, documents, letters, missives, saying the following. Kir right? you should call a fast day. Vahoshivu et Navot Barosha An. 
And on that fast day, which where the people are gathered together for assembly, perhaps to lament or pray, you should put Navot at the head of all the people. Now notice that on the side I've labeled these one and two, because these are two phrases that are going to repeat later on in the narrative. Vaushivu shnayim anashim al negdo. You should sit two worthless people, right, two criminal types, right, next to him. And right, you should um, uh, <coughs> warn them or admonish them as follows. Or, 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 or sorry, they should accuse him. I'm sorry. As follows. Beirachta Elohim Vamelech. Vahotziu. Right? You, Navo, have cursed. It says literally blessed, but you have cursed, right? In a euphemistic way. You have blessed, cursed both God and King, and you should take him out. Vesikluhu Vyamot. You take him out, stone him, so that he dies. Okay? This is the plot. Now I've tried to label like each word and phrase, and I've counted ten of them here. Okay? Now, when they actually fulfill this, remember what this is called? The command fulfillment sequence. Right? Here. The command is given, and then the command is executed. When they actually do it, it's similar but not identical. Kiru Karutzon, they uh, they uh, called for a fast day assembly or something. Vaushivu et Navot Baroshaan, they they sat Navot at the head of the people. This is almost word for word. Vayavo Shnei Anashim Bnei Bnei. Uh, uh, and uh, the two uh, unscrupulous, right, criminal men came. They sat next to him. Right, and they accused him. And the order here is almost the same as in the command. One, two, four, three, five. Okay? And then we find uh, that the, they use the following language. Beirach uh, Navot Elohim Vamelech, he uh, he Navot had uh, cursed, literally blessed God and King. Vayotziu Bichutz Lair, they took him outside the city. Vayiskalu and they um, uh, they stoned him Ba'avanim with stones, which wasn't mentioned before. Vayamot and he died. And the order here is six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The order is the same. It's almost exactly the same. This is about as close as you get in biblical narrative to verbatim repetition. But usually that's not the case. You remember one of the examples that we've looked at before, right? Remember when the Israelites circled Jericho in order to bring down the walls, right? It first tells you how they did it on the first day. The people are, are marching around and the priests carry the ark and the, uh, the shofar horns are, are, go before them, and that's what they do, on, and they go around the city first day. And the second day it says they did something similar. And then it says, that's what they did for six days. And if this were epic, what would you have? This is what they, you would repeat exactly what they did on the third day, exactly what they did on the fourth day, the same thing on the fifth day, same thing on the sixth day, and the seventh day is different, so both in the epic and in the prose, you would have to describe what was done on the seventh day in a different way. Okay? But that kind of abbreviation is typical of prose because we're dealing with two different media. Right? The medium of declaiming something orally, that is the media of song, oral, oral. That is, it's oral. Somebody says it out of the mouth, and then it's oral in the ear. Mm -hmm. right? Oral, oral. Somebody says it, somebody hears it. And when it's on a, on a live occasion like that, all of the repetition right, satisfies the audience because there is an aesthetic of enjoying the repetition just like children and just like we do when we join in the chorus of a song where everybody's joining in and singing together.
Okay. However, biblical narrative, right, is writ is written down at least within a context of written literature, which means that there's already an influence of a different aesthetic, the aesthetic of reading. And when we read, we economize. We don't like to waste time. We don't like to read things that we've already read before. If we can already predict what's going to be said, we just go on to the next thing. Why? Because we're not participating in the same way. If we were singing together, we would all participate. We would enjoy the repetitions, just like in the chorus of a song. But when we're reading, we, don't, we, we want to get to the next thing. We don't want to waste our time. It's a whole different aesthetic. And you see the aesthetic in most of uh, biblical narrative. Okay. So, we now... I now want to try to suggest that in the Bible we actually have evidence of um, epics that were in the background. Now this of course has been suggested before. Uh, the most extensive argument for this has been made by Umberto Casuto, Moshe David Casuto. It was also made by William F. Albright, by his student Frank Cross and his school, and uh, by others who are, in a sense, the, the children and grandchildren of Casuto and Albright, etc., <coughs> among which uh, I am, because uh, my teacher Moshe Held, may he rest in peace, was a student of Casuto. And, and he did his doctorate officially under Albright. Okay, so, um, so that different scholars uh, follow the same thesis, but of course not blindly, but because we find evidence. Okay, so what do we find in the Bible? What we find in the Bible are a number of different things. First of all, in the middle of, bibl of a biblical narrative, you can find a sudden burst of poetry, a sudden burst of song. For example, in the story of the flood, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, where you have a very dry description of the timing of the flood, you know, the dates and what happened, etc., in a very dry way, and then suddenly, when the flood came, Nivku kol mayanot to home rabah, va'arubot hashamayim niftahu, right? The, uh, the founts of the deep of the uh, subterranean ocean were broken open because springs and rivers were understood to come up through the earth from water that, li that, that, that lay below the surface. So this, all, of the, all of a sudden this water comes out, so the flood is coming from below. Va'arubot hashamayim niftahu And the windows of the sky broke open. You have it uh, on the second page of your handout uh, it's number 14, although you, know, you can see I'm going out of order because I've excerpted this from uh, a different handout. Right? But there you find it you know, on the handout. Okay, so you here have a particular language here. You have the verb baka, to split open, which is very poetic. You've got tohom, which is only a poetic word. The only place in the whole Bible where it's not in a poem is in Genesis chapter 1, which has many... Uh, poetic features to it. Arubot the, the uh, windows of the sky, a very poetic word. It's the B word or poetic word of chalon, window, in Ugaritic. And niftach, of course, is a relatively pedestrian word. That's just the word for opening up. Okay, but what is it doing in the middle of a prose narrative, especially a dry section? It doesn't seem to me at all likely that a scribe who was writing this story would have sat down and in the middle of this dry section would have invented this old archaic poem or excerpt of a poem, a couple. But it makes a lot of sense to me if the scribe had, or the author had known an earlier epic about the flood and it decided to use this line at this point because it fits right in. 
the people might already know the song, and familiarity, as I've told you before, breeds contentment. People enjoy the repetition because it's familiar and they can uh, participate uh, in reciting it to, either together with the singer or to themselves as the singer uh, holds forth. Okay, so, we, and we've got several of these snippets of verse in various places in biblical narrative. In addition, what we find in biblical narrative are a number of the, um, of the formulas that we find in biblical, uh, sorry, in early Canaanite epic that somehow have a reflex in, uh, in biblical narrative, right? For example, the whole thing about Vayisa, right, Enav, his eyes, Vayar, or Vatisa, right, Kola, her voice, Vatef. These are exact replicas, almost using the same vocabulary, of formulas that we find in Ugritic, that is an early Canaanite epic. Right? And if you read the Ugritic epics, many times you'll come across, right, he raised his voice or she raised her voice and cried out. Or he raised her his eyes, she raised her eyes and saw, or they raised their eyes and saw, etc. We find it many times in biblical narrative. Where? In biblical prose narrative. Now, if this were taken from biblical poetry, and if it were the ancient poetry that influenced Israelite poetry alone, where would we expect to find these formulas? We'd expect to find them in biblical poetry. But we don't find them in any narrative section, even though there are some sections of narrative, in biblical poetry. Nowhere there. Once or twice in the prophetic literature, you have a command, raise up your eyes and see. But never, he lifted up his eyes and saw, she lifted up her voice and cried, etc., etc. This pattern is not at all found, except in the instance or two I mentioned, of, uh, of a command, of an imperative, not found in biblical verse. So where does it come from? Well, it doesn't come directly from Ugaritic, we know, because the words are a little different. The word for seeing, for example, is a verb that we don't have in Hebrew. Pe, he, yud, which you never heard of, and which most of us never heard of, but it's found all over in Ugaritic epic. So where did they get these formulas from? Why was it part of the convention of biblical narrative to use these formulas? It seems to me very apparent that it was because there was an early Israelite epic which, like earlier Ugaritic Canaanite epic, used these formulas. They became naturalized in Israelite literature in epic. And then, as prose narrative developed later, as writing became much more widespread in ancient Israel, probably in the period of the kingdoms. Then, the, uh, uh, the, the epic, okay, the epic forms were transformed into prose narrative. Or, if you want to put it a different way, the, the, the prose writers who were writing these narratives uh, uh, adopted and adapted many of the the formulas that they used from the epics with which they were familiar and which many people probably could sing by heart and which they probably learned by heart in the same way that we have learned many songs by heart and used the language of songs that we have learned when we're writing whatever we write, whether it's a letter or even an essay or a paper. Okay, so it seems to me then that there is you know, very strong evidence for epic. I could bring other arguments also, but I want to get to the next point. Can we reconstruct any of that epic? Can we reconstruct any of that epic? And 
my uh, feeling is that we can but not whole epics, because we would need to have the whole story, we would have to know the whole plot, and then of course we would have to know enough about ancient epic to, to write something in an early form of Biblical Hebrew that would conform to the epic style. And some of us can probably do that with a lot of effort, getting you know, corrected you know, by our friends. You know, in, in league with others, we could probably produce something that seemed pretty convincing. But we would also need to know what language was being used. Okay, so this is my little research project. I, uh, I began to look at various wordings that we find in later biblical poems that are spread in many different places that seem to use the same language as though they were all drawn from the same source. In other words, in cases where you can't really say that a poem, a poet, excuse me, is copying from an earlier poem, a specific poem, but rather that different poets in different times in probably different areas of Israel were using similar phrases because those phrases were known how were they known? From the earlier poetic corpus. Sometimes we can, we can discover that by looking at the biblical corpus itself. Some of you know that I published an article, I mentioned it I think, on um, the, the use of Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses or the Ha'azinu poem in, in the book of Job. And it's published in this book published only a couple of years ago, called Reading Job Intertextually. And what I show there is that there are at least 12 instances in which language that we know only from the Song of Moses, Shirat Azinu, Deuteronomy 32, are found in the book of Job. And he in fact parodies some of that language in Job. I'll give you one example. That's, this is not on your handout. If you look in first in Deuteronomy 32, okay, if you want to know the knowledge, right, the kind of collective memory and traditions of the people, where do you go? Yes. You don't Google. What do you do? You go to the earlier generations. And so if you look in Deuteronomy 32, verse 7, Zechor Yemot Olam, recall the days of old, primeval times. Binu Shnot Dor Vador, right? Take a look, Pehid, to the years of generations gone by. Sha'al Avicha Viagedicha, ask your father or your ancestors. And he will tell you, Zikenecha, the Yomulach, ask your elders, and they will inform you. Okay, now, when Job wants to make fun of wisdom, and especially the wisdom or the pseudo wisdom that his friends right, are, uh, are spouting in his face, what he does in Job chapter 12 is to make a parody of these lines from Deuteronomy 32. The, uh, uh, starting in Job 12, verse 7. Rather, instead of the various wisdom snippets that you are exciting to me, ask Behemot, ask the hippopotamus or the semi-mythological hippopotamus, Vitoreka, and she will instruct you. Don't ask your elders, go to nature, go to the beasts around you, they will give you instruction. Go to the fowl of the sky, the birds, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will instruct you. And the fish of the sea will inform you. This is clearly 
explained very clearly, a parody of that uh, classic poem in Deuteronomy, and the fact that we have another dozen instances of the use of Deuteronomy 32 in Job, to me, makes a very strong case that there is a knowledge of that poem and a reuse of that poem by Job, or the, rather by the poet of Job, who lives centuries later. This poet uses material from many other places as well, from Isaiah, from what we call Second Isaiah, uh, from Amos, uh, from Hosea or Hosea, right? Uh, from, but 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 quite a lot from uh, Deuteronomy 32 and from Jeremiah. In any case, my point is not to review uh, that article and but rather just to use this as a model of a later poet using the work of earlier poets. So what do we find in the Tanakh? Now go to the second slide of the handout, please, at the top. First, from Proverbs 3, verse 20, right? Speaking of God and God's uh, greatness as creator, B'da'ato tehomot nivka'u u'shechakim yir'afu ta'a. Right? With, by God's knowledge, because of God's knowledge, the kind of uh, esoteric knowledge by which he created and governs the world, the great deeps, right, that is the subterranean ocean, was opened up and the skies dripped down dew. Now this phrase, Yerafuta, where does that come from? That also, that also comes from Deuteronomy 32. Okay, so we find then two different phrases, one of them identical to the phrase in Genesis chapter 7, 11, Nivku'u kol ma'inot tohom rabau, almost identical, tohomot nivka'u, and we also have the phrase yura'afuta, which we know from Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses. Let's go now to the next example from Isaiah 24, 18. Ki arubot mimarom niftahu. The windows from above were opened up, which is almost the same as the second part of Genesis 7:11 from the flood story, but it's not identical. You see, it's the similar phrases used repeatedly in different places in the Tanakh. By your Ashu Moste Aret, and the uh, foundations of the earth shivered, trembled, shook. Okay? In the second part of the verse. Now that second part of the verse it doesn't have any parallel in the verse from Genesis 7 or in the verse in Proverbs 3. However, if you look in Psalm 18, verse 8, you find batigash batirash ha'aretz. The earth shivered, trembled, using that same combination of earth and the verb for shuddering or shivering or quaking. Umos dei harim yurgazu, and there you also find the the the, uh, the word for the foundations of the earth. Except here it's used for the foundations of the mountains. The foundations of the mountain trembled, shook. Okay, so what you see here again is a case where none of these verses could have been a direct influence on the other verse because none of them is the same. In fact, usually it's the case that only half the verse is similar to one of the other verses. And yet, we see that the same phrases are used and reused. Where do these phrases come from? How is it that these disparate poets could all be using these same phrases? To me, based on everything that we've learned up till now and what I've said earlier uh, today, it seems pretty clear that there was a corpus of archaic or old Hebrew poetry, which precedes the Tanakh, maybe they were in epic form, and the poets simply draw on that material because it's familiar, because that's the material that they learn by heart. We know, remember the book by David Carter that we mentioned before? Writing on the tablet of the heart, ancient scribes memorized texts. The texts that they wrote down were texts they already knew by heart. That was scribal activity. 
Not reading something that you've never read, I'm sorry, writing or copying something you've never read before, but just the opposite, writing something that you already know for whatever purpose. And of course, not everything was written. Okay, so, again, the thesis is that the poets are drawing on this older material, possibly older um, epics. And what might these epics be about? Well, a couple of these examples clearly could be an epic about the flood story. Another could be about God appearing in a particular circumstance when the earth shook. It could be like the Mount Sinai revelation, when the mountain shook and the people shook. It could be some other revelation. It might remind you, I'm sure it reminds somebody here, of the Song of Deborah. Right? In Judges chapter 5. It could be from some other story that we just don't know or that we can't imagine is connected to this. Okay, but it seems to me that we have that pattern. Now let's look at the next example, and here I believe we can perhaps reconstruct the story from which it's coming, or at least we can imagine the story from which it might be coming. First, we, we, we quote a couple lines from the, the song at the sea sometimes called the Song of the Sea, but the sea isn't singing, right? It's a song that the Israelites sang at the sea. It's placed in the mouth of Moses and the Israelites, but when you get to the end of the song, you see that Miriam and the women are singing the song, and because it's a victory song, it's been suggested by Shlomo Dov Goitain and others that this, in fact, might be a woman's song. It's, it's, uh, you, I think I've told you that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Right, there's a fragment of rewritten Pentateuch in which we find this section. And in fact, it, it, it seems that the scribe invented a song parallel to the song the men sang to give to the women to sing. Right? It's, it's similar, but not the same. Okay, but that's for another occasion to look at that. Okay, so now let's look at these examples. From Exodus 15:8. The water piled up, as the Israelites crossed the sea, the water piled up at the, the, through the wind of your nostrils, right? God's nostrils blast forth wind so strong that it causes the water to pile up in columns. Okay? Similarly, in verse 10, in the same place, Kisamo Yam. Okay, you uh, you breathe out with your very strong breath, and the sea covered over the Egyptians. Okay, so again we have the blast of the nostrils. Okay, so that's one element that we find here. Now let's go to a different poem, which we've quoted from before, Psalm 18, which is also considered an early biblical poem. Verse 17 has a parallel in 2 Samuel 22, uh, as you know. Vayigalu mosdot tebel. Right when God appears, the foundations of the dry land are exposed. Migaratcha Adonai, because of your rebuke. In other words, when you scream at the people or at the world or whatever, we'll talk a little more about what God is screaming at. When God screams, it causes a tremendous force right, to blow the water away so that you can see all the way down to the foundations of the earth. <coughs> From the breath of the wind of your nostrils or your nose. Aha! Uh -huh. So now what we found is that the phrase, the blast of wind of your nose, is repeated, as well as this verb, in, now in a nominal form, ga, ga'ar, to rebuke or to scream at. Now we turn to a, a text of a very different type, a, a text describing God's governance of the world in creation, Psalm 104, and in verses 6 and 7 we read, to whom Kalavush Kisito, right? Uh, you, God, have uh, covered 
uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the earth with the, the uh, watery uh, abyss or the subterranean ocean. Al Harim Yamdu Mai. Over the uh, mountains, water stands. In other words, you're covering the earth right with water, which reminds you very much of the flood story. And of course, you have here again the use of the verb to home, referring to the the ocean. Min ga'aratcha yinusum. But when you rebuke them, or when you scream at them, right from your ga'ara, the same word, the waters flee. That that is, they retreat. They draw back. Min kol ra'cha They hurry away from the sound of your thunder. In other words, you scream at them. And how is God's screaming represented in nature? Through the thunder, right? And of course, what aspect of God or what persona of God is the one that screams thunder? God as the storm God, the one who brings the storm, right? God's voice is the thunder, as we know from Psalm 18, right? As we know, um, I would also say from Exodus 19 in the Sinai Revelation and other places. Now we look also, of course, the Baal epic uh, from uh, Ugarit from 1400 or so BCE. Now we look at the next text from Nahum or Nahum, verse uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 4. Again, describing God in the storm guard. God persona. Go air by Yam by God rebukes or screams at the sea and dries it up. Notice that this type of screaming is not simply rebuke, it's not just reproach. Ga'ar has a physical aspect to it. In each of these cases, there is wind pushing forward. It has a physical force and it has physical consequences. Go air by yam by God rebukes the sea, or screams at the sea. It comes out with a tremendous amount of breath, and I don't want to try to imitate it here, and dries up the sea. Sounds like right, the, uh, the crossing of the sea, maybe even the, um, uh, the flood story. The chol hanarot hechri, and all of the currents of water, God dried up. So again, you see, the language of Ga'ar, which is also found in Ugaritic, is, is here uh, used over and over again for the blast of wind that comes from God that pushes back the water. Now, Psalm 106, verse 9. Vayig'ar biyam suf, vayecharav. God, right, screams at the sea of reeds, and it dries up. Here referring, of course, to the splitting of the sea, or the drying of the sea, as the Israelites left Egypt in the Exodus. And it produced dry land. So it, it seems to me very clear that when there was a, an epic or story in verse narrative form, epic, of the crossing of the sea, of the exodus from Egypt, the verb ga'ar was used, even though in Exodus 15 we don't find it. But we find it in many other references, because Exodus 15, you see, is not the epic that tells the story of the crossing of the sea, of the drawing of the sea. It refers to that story, but it doesn't tell the story. It's a song of praise for God, alluding to the crossing of the sea, but itself, it is not the story. It makes reference to the story, but it's not the story. Did the story, the story exists in prose form in Exodus chapter 14. But was there an epic of the, of the, uh, of the, of the splitting of the sea, the drawing of the seabed, and the crossing of the Israelites, I imagine that there was. And I also imagine that the verb ga'ar, 
was used there, just as the phrase ruach apo or ruach apecha is used there, the, the, uh, the wind of the nose or the nostrils. Now we look in Isaiah chapter 50, which comes, of course, from the Babylonian exile. Verse 2. Hen bega'arati acharib yam asim narot midbar. Here it seems that God is now recounting the powers that God has shown in the, at the Exodus. Hen bega'arati acharib yam. With the screaming, my screaming, or I would say, you know, somehow my, uh, uh, my production of very strong wind, right, in a rebuking mode, something like that. I have uh, dried up the sea. I seem now wrote the bar. I have made, turned the currents of water into desert. In other words, again, we have the Ga'ara associated with the same classic story, which probably goes back to an epic. I can't show you the whole epic. I can't show you the narrative. It doesn't exist. Because the narrative that we have in Exodus 14 probably alludes to it. I would be very surprised if we didn't find, for example, in the original story, the phrase miminam u mismolam, right, at, uh, that the waters uh, 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 arose like a wall on the right and the left, which repeats a few times. I would be surprised if we didn't have that, but we don't have that story. We don't have God blasting with God's nose. That's a mythic, epic, classic, image of God, right, pushing the waters back in a very direct, personal way. As it says at the end of Exodus 14, God is doing battle for the Israelites. But rather, in Exodus 14, we have the story of how God sent a wind, and it's the wind that dried up the waters. But here, it's the wind that comes right out of God's face. Okay, now I would like to uh, look at one other example. The splitting and drying up the water for the people to cross, right? Which, of course, goes back to the same story. In other words, even though so far I've only reconstructed basically one motif and a few phrases from uh, that, the, the uh, hypothetical epic of the crossing of the sea or the exodus from Egypt, God's growling at and blasting the sea. I believe that we can, I can give you another example. That when God splits and, uh, the sea and dries the water for the people to cross. Because here too we have a number of different examples using similar language. In Exodus 14, 16, which of course is the prose narrative, right, we, hear, we have here. Right, you, Moses, should stretch your hand, your arm, over the sea, and split the sea using the verb baka. In later Jewish tradition, we don't, we don't call it bikiyat yamsuf, we call it kriyat yamsuf, the tearing of the sea. Right? But here, the classical term is baka. We had that same verb used, if you remember, in the flood story in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, and in other verses that we cited then. Okay, now I'd like to continue. So, spread your arm over the sea, split the sea, uva ka'eu, using this verb, vayavau v'nei Yisrael b'toch hayam b'yabasha, and the Israelites, right, will, uh, will, will, um, will enter the sea on dry land. These phrases that I've highlighted on the handout, the sea, the dry land, and the verb to split, right? I believe are taken from the epic of the crossing of the sea. Because they're used in a number of different places over and over again where the verses do not repeat the same language as any other verse. 
In other words, the, the motif and the phrases repeat, but not the whole line. It's not a copying of the line. It's just a use of the phrase. For example, in, in, again, in Exodus 14.21, Vayasem et hayam lechorava, right, God uh, uh, made the sea into dry land, which is a more poetic term than yabasha, dry land, vayibak'u amayim, and the waters were split apart. Again, using that same verb, baka. Now we look at Psalm 78.13, which I believe is a relatively early uh, poem. And there too we find the verb baka. Baka yam, God split the sea, vayavi rain, and had the people cross. Vayatsev mayim kumone, and set up the water like a column, like a nade. Where else do you find nade used as the column of water in the crossing of the sea? In the song at, uh, uh, at the sea, in Exodus 15, right? Uh, Nehemu, uh, come on, my. No, no, sorry. Nitzvok, Nitzvok, come on, Nate, knows Lynn. Right, the, the flowing waters, right, were, uh, stood up like a column. And here we have it. Thank you. Okay, so we have Nate used in this context as well. Okay, Joshua chapter three, verse seventeen, where the crossing of the Jordan is paradigmatically described like the crossing of the sea. In other words, the Israelites leaving Egypt to cross the sea, and very similar description is used in order to relate the story of the Israelites crossing the Jordan River and entering the land of Israel. The whole Yisrael overim becharava, using of course the verb avar, which is not such a big deal because it's the regular word for crossing. Becharava, a very poetic word for the dry land, which we've seen in the text above, ad asher tamu kol agoy lavor et ayardin, until the entire people had completed crossing the Jordan. So the verb avar, of course, is used, although sort of expectedly, but still in all of these cases, and the use of the poetic term cholama <coughs> instead of yabasha. And in 2 Kings 2.8, we have another reference, in the same way that when I write a letter or when I write an essay, I will sometimes use language from literature that I know in order to make it flowery or just to uh, relate it or to be cute or to allude perhaps to another text, you know, to make it sound good to my audience in the same way the narrator here in 2 Kings 2 is using language that I believe is taken from an early Israelite epic of the flood. Now, just to show you that we're talking about two different things, I would like to read you from the book of Nehemiah. And in Nehemiah, chapter 9, verse 11, we also have the story of the Exodus crossing the sea. Vahayam bakata lifnehem. You, God, split the sea ahead of them. Vayaavru v'toch hayam bayabasha. And they crossed the sea on dry land, yabasha. V'yet rotfehem ishlachta. And you threw down their pursuers, v'mtsolot, into the depths of the sea into the uh, uh, you know, the churning sea kamo evan bamayamazin like a stone in um, strong or fierce waters now the reason that I don't think that this is taken directly from epic is because it seems to be influenced both by the prose story of the crossing of the sea in Exodus 14 and by the song at the sea in Exodus 15. We know that Ezra and Nehemiah had already a, the Torah, the five books of Moses, Pentateuch, right? And they were able to take directly from there. But my claim is that when the, the authors who first wrote the prose narratives of the Pentateuch and 
other early Israelite narratives, they didn't have the Pentateuch to look at. What did they have in order to, where, from, where, from which they could draw their language? What were their literary sources? Right? How did they become such great writers? How did they know so much language to begin with? Because they had already assimilated earlier Israelite epic literature and other poems. The evidence of which you find in their language. And I believe that if we look more thoroughly and carefully at other places in biblical poetry and biblical literature, we'll be able to find more phrases that we might be able to attribute to this earlier literature. In any case, what I hope to have shown is that biblical prose narrative right, is very developed form, but it doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of earlier epic, but not directly from Ugaritic epic, which was buried at Ugar Ugarit in 1200 BCE, and uh, nobody had any direct access to it. Archaeologists only began uh, uncovering tablets there in 1929, but they had it from earlier Israelite and Canaanite epic. But the Canaanites aren't going to tell the story of the Israelite exodus from Egypt and the crossing of the sea, but the Israelites were going to tell that story. And the Israelites told that story. And how did they tell that story? They told that story the way that most people told stories. They sang it in epic song. Where are those epics? Well, they're incorporated in phrases and motifs here and there in the literature that we have. That's what ancient scribes do. They incorporate material that they have in the same way that when we write, we also incorporate material that we have, and that's what we call intertextuality. Thank you very much. No, no.